clap for standing up. <laughs> That's not bad. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say this must be one of the most exciting bookshop uh, bookshops I've ever been in, and it's the kind of place which would bankrupt me if I stayed here for too long. Um, I could spend hours here by looking at the titles. Um, and the amazing thing is it's in America, or the United States of America, um, considering the, Im the image that they portray of um, the average American in Europe. Um, and the political situation in, in this country. Um, well, my, my task today is, is to discuss um, China and put forward our analysis of what's happening in China. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that what has happened in China in the last 30 years is, a, is really an unprecedented phenomenon um, because although we saw the Soviet Union collapse, um, the, what has happened in China <coughs> Is, uh, is unique in the sense that it's moved towards capitalism <laughs> without any collapse such as we saw in the Soviet Union where the old system really came crashing down, not only economically but also politically with the breakup of the Soviet Union. In China they've managed to keep in power the same, the same bureaucracy as before, but, having, but adopting methods which have, have pushed uh, China um, on the road to capitalism. Now, oh, I thought they were coming in here. What a, what a pity. Um, but before going on to that, uh, ask ourselves a few ba basic questions. Um, I hope I'm not too banal. And I'm not taking, uh, don't take for granted anything. You know, first of all, we have to ask, ask ourselves, what is communism? What is socialism? What is a worker state? Because of course, if you if you read the mainstream American media, communism is a terrible dictatorial regime that has gulags and tortures people and oppresses people, and and it's a disaster. It's the worst thing you could ever imagine. Um, but uh, that's obviously the, in the interests of the bourgeois media, the elite, to present that. I believe the reason they do that is because what they fear is that one day the American workers will realize that uh, their standard of living. Uh, what they've achieved in all these decades is in danger, it's being eaten away slowly by the system and people are, gonna, are beginning to question this system. Why is it that we live in the conditions that we live in? Why is it that we have the wages that we have? I mean I've heard of uh, people earning a thousand dollars a month in this country which is incredible when you think that this is supposed to be the... This is the country where if you go to a place like Nigeria where I've been people dream of coming here people pray to come here. Um, some people really, literally believe them. the sidewalks are made of gold and you pick up money off, off, the, off the road. Of course, once they do get here, they discover that it's somewhat um, uh, different. But if the workers of America uh, are moving in the direction of looking for answers to why this system is in crisis, as a Marxist, I would say the only final solution to that is they discover that the solution is a socialist America. Now that may seem a bit utopian, but uh, it's the only it's the only road that they can go down. Now, communism, if we look at it from you know the the, the long term goal of a, of a transformation of society, is a society where you have, according to Marx, superabundance. You have so much wealth being produced that there is no need for poverty, classes, divisions between nations, and you can have a harmonious development of society. Now to achieve that, obviously, you have to develop the productive forces to a level that we've never seen before. Um, on the road to communism, you have socialism, you have the worker state. What is a worker state? A worker state is a state which is obviously controlled by the working class which runs the economy according to the interests of the working class, uses the productive forces not for profit, not for warmongering, not for concentrating the wealth. I mean, I was listening to a comrade the day saying that in America, the 1% richest section of the population actually has in its hands 95% of the country's wealth. Um, that 
is what this system is there for. It's for accumulating wealth at one end of society and, and, it, and it creates poverty at the other end. But that immense wealth could be used in a different way to guarantee health care, education, decent housing. Capitalism isn't even capable of using all its productive forces. When you think that on America, North America and other major advanced capitalist countries at this moment are not using around 30% of productive capacity. The reason they're not using it is because they can't sell the goods, because the workers don't earn enough. But if you're pushing down the wages of American workers, of European workers, of Japanese workers, um, then inevitably you're not going to be able to sell all the goods that you produce. There's a contradiction in the system. Now, we could move towards a, a, a genuine socialist society, considering the level of science that we've, received, we've reached, the level of technology, the level of development of the productive forces. I mean, if, if we can send ship, spaceships, uh, probes beyond the, 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 the you know, outer solar system, if we can send uh, robots to Mars that land, open up, move around, dig the land, analyze the, the, the minerals, uh, and send the signals back, some fun, we can do all that. But we can't feed people in, in, in large parts of this planet. People go hungry, and yet we can do that. It, th that's the immense contradiction that this system has, uh, has uh, created. Um, food shortages are presented as natural calamities. Well, in actual fact, there is no shortage of food. You just, you just look at the statistics. They produce, the world produces enough food to guarantee everybody a decent um, daily diet, and yet people go hungry. There's hoarding of food in some parts of the world, and there's people starving in others. And the reason for that is the profit motive. So the obstacle to achieving a socialist society and a transformation society and a solution to these problems is capitalism itself. And that means the ownership uh, of the means of production in private hands. Now, communism, or f it, from Marxist, is the most democratic form of society that can exist. It's presented as a dictatorship because they look at Stalin, they look at Pol Pot and all these kind of regimes who, claim, who, who presented themselves as communist, and they said that is communism. That has nothing to do with communism as far as we are concerned, because communism means control over planning and production by the working class through democratic decision-making bodies. The workers should decide what is produced, how much is produced, and for what. In these countries, like the Soviet Union in the past, and China in the past, what you had was economic planning, which is an essential part of a worker state, but it wasn't decided by the working class, it was decided by a bureaucracy which had risen above the working class. And um, actually was, was, it was a dictatorship over the working class, and there was no genuine workers' control and management um, of the economy. So, to clarify, if we go back to the question which is asked in the poster, is China communist or capitalist? First of all, the question should be, was it communist? And we would argue that it was not. It wasn't capitalist either. Uh, that, that, that's the answer to, to that question. What we had was a planned economy which achieved some ama amazing results. The Chinese Revolution of 1949 led to the abolition of capitalism. Um, and I haven't got time, I'm not going to go into a detailed history of, of what happened there, but the, the tendency that we trace our roots to, that's the In Defense of Marxism website, um, which, if anybody's heard of the militant tendency in the past in Britain, which was a sizable tendency in the Labour Party, and before that, going right back to the Second World War, uh, the tendency around uh, Ted Grant, who was a British Trotskyist, our comrades of that period supported the Chinese Revolution and declared that it was the second most important event in, his, in history because after the Russian Revolution it liberated a huge section of the world from feudalism and capitalism and um, laid the economic basis for a transformation of, um, of society through the planning of the economy. And I'll give some figures later on. However, Marx did explain that the emancipation of the working class, um, the emancipation of the working class is the task of the working class itself. No one can emancipate the working class for the working class, otherwise you're into the logic of Robin Hood who steals from the rich to give to the poor. 
Um, where we've seen social transformations not carried out directly by the working class, consciously controlling the process, what we've ended up with is a halfway system, such as China, such as Vietnam, and such as many other countries, where you have the economic base for the development of socialism, but you don't have the political superstructure of, of a genuine worker state. And um, in the Soviet Union, again, it's a separate discussion, we had the first attempt in history of the workers to take power and run society according to a, a different rationale. Um, but because of the backwardness of that country, the isolation of that country, and the defeat of one revolution after another, the country was isolated, and in reality the Bolsheviks were, 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 were drowned in, in the backwardness of the country, and the, the, the regime degenerated along Stalinist lines, which was from genuine workers' democracy of the first few years to a planned economy, but not socialism. Um, the working class was not in control, there was no workers' control and management over industry, and there were no democratic decision-making bodies elected by the workers. Instead, a bureaucracy lifting itself more and more above, above society. Um, now, the Chinese Revolution modelled itself on the Soviet Union, not as it was in 1917, but as it was in 1949, i.e. a Stalinist Soviet Union with a Stalinist uh, bureaucracy and dictatorship, a one-party dictatorship with a privileged bureaucracy. And we have to understand that the bureaucracy, although they weren't capitalists in the sense that they didn't own the means of production and they didn't run factories according to the profit motive, didn't compete against each other, they planned the economy, it was a, it was a, a bureaucracy which, which was materially living above the conditions of workers and developed an interest of its own, a caste within the system, a little bit like in a trade union today in, 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 in the West. Uh, the trade union is a workers' organization made up of workers, but the people at the top of the trade unions live on completely different conditions to the average worker they're supposed to represent. And although it's still a fighting workers' organization, these unions have some problems precisely because of this layer at the top, um, which, is, which, is, which has, have different interests to the members of the union. Now, um, because Ch China was an extremely backward, underdeveloped country when the revolution took place, the Chinese Revolution, in spite of these deformations and limitations, was an enormously progressive step in the development of, of, of society. As, as we say, we consider it the second most important event after the Russian Revolution because of the scope that it had. And look at some figures. Between 1949 and 57, the Chinese economy grew by about 11% a year. Between 1957 and 1970, by about 9% a year. Um, now compare that to growth in the West average growth in the capitalist countries in the West it didn't reach this level. There were a few exceptions like Japan for a few years. But most of the capitalist countries had the, and this was the, the biggest, most powerful boom that capitalism had ever seen between 1948 and 73. They didn't reach the same level of growth um, as China, of course. Having said that, it doesn't describe the real situation because obviously China was starting from a very backward level, whereas Western Europe and North America were already uh, advanced uh, industrial countries. Nonetheless, the development of China in that period, if you compare it, say, to India, it was at least twice the rate of growth that India uh, was able to achieve in the same period. St and they were two big countries starting more or less on the same level. Just one indication, in 1952, China, think of the size of the country, produced only 1,000 tractors a year. Almost nothing compared to the needs of the country. By 1976, it was producing 190,000 tractors. Now, that's a significant step in the development of the productive forces because it enormously um, increases productive capacity in agriculture, which, which, which produces the basic needs of, uh, of ordinary working people. It was an enormous step forward um, for, for, uh, for China. Um, in the midst of this period, we did have, and again, I can't go into the details of that, you had events such as the Great Leap Forward of 1958, the Cultural Revolution, Revolution 1966, which, far from actually pushing the economy forward, led to in, immense dislocation of the economy. For example, in the, in, in the year between 67 and 68, industrial production in China fell by 15%, um, as a result directly of the, of the adventures of the Cultural Revolution. Now, 
As the economy in China grew and became more sophisticated, the bureaucracy tended to raise itself more and more above society. This is what we saw in the Soviet Union. In the beginning, in the, in the late 20s, if you looked at the bureaucracy, the difference between the, the level of, of, of uh, the living conditions of the bureaucracy and, and the workers wasn't so big. But as the economy developed, the, 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 the differentiation grew more and more. And, they, and they, the, at some, some of the bureaucrats started living almost like Western capitalists. In China, a similar process developed. And if you see in 1976, if you take an, an average industrial worker working 48 hours a week, he was earning the equivalent of $12 a month. While professionals in China in the same period were earning $120 a month. You see a differential of 10 to 1. That means that there was a layer of society living well above the average uh, of ordinary working people. And they, that layer of society assumes its own I interests um, as opposed to that of the masses. Now if we go back to Mao, Mao believed that you could create the communist man uh, first who would then build communism. Now, that goes against all thinking of, 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 uh, of uh, classical Marxism. Marxists believe that conditions determine consciousness, and not the other way around. You cannot, you don't, consciousness doesn't determine the conditions. You, you have to develop the productive forces in order to create the conditions which allow human beings to live differently, um, i.e., create the superabundance materially, which then allows people to abandon their individualism and the, you know, the rat race of one against the other, because there's enough for everybody to go around. If there's, if there's um, shortages, you're going to have conflicts in society. Um, and therefore, you need to develop the productive forces first. Within, within the Chinese bureaucracy, it was clear there was a large number that considered Mao's adventures to be damaging for the economy, um, that they were not pushing the economy forward, um, and were looking for something else. And you see that after his death, um, and the, the Mao, I mean, it's a separate discussion, but he, as he emerged as the leader of the, the People's Army, and he was a military strategist and came to power on the backs of that, had enormous authority within Chinese society, and was able, therefore, to, to be the classical Bonapartist at the top of the system. But within the immense million-strong million, million bureaucracy, um, you can see there was a different uh, uh, school of thought. There was different thinking taking place. And as soon as he died, it was very quick, the change that took place um, in China. Um, and I'll go back to that in, in, in a minute. We have, to, we have to remember also the impact of world events on China. Although it was a very insular society under Maoist, uh, um, you know, un un under Maoism, uh, closed borders and sort of almost um, uh, aut autarky, I would develop ourselves without any any interchange, any exchange with the world market. What was happening around the world, and particularly in the Soviet Union, had an impact inside China. The Soviet Union um, began to slow down. The more the bureaucracy developed, the more it became a suffocating apparatus on, 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 on the economy itself. And from the peaks of the huge growth of the 30s, it slowed down to around 10% a year after the war. And by the 70s, the Soviet Union was growing 2 or 3%. By the 80s, it was zero and it was stagnating. And that explains fundamentally why the, Stal why, um, uh, the Stalinist Soviet Union eventually collapsed. The system was no longer to able to develop the productive forces um, in, um, in uh, China. Now this led to a section of the Chinese bureaucracy considering a NEP type policy, that is a new economic policy, which is what the Bolsheviks were forced to adopt in the 20s in the isolated conditions of the Soviet Union. Because the productive forces were so limited, you couldn't plan the development of every section of the economy. They, they liberalized sections of the economy, for example, allowing the peasants to produce for the market and sell their goods, which was a capitalist type reform. In China, they started adopting something similar. Uh, there was a brief moment after Mao's death when the Gang of Four tried, where well, they were actually consciously trying to go back to the Cultural Revolution of Mao, but you see 
how weak they were within the Chinese bureaucracy. They were immediately arrested in October 76. They never re-emerged as powerful figures in, in China. And Deng eventually emerged at the top of the Communist Party. Deng Xiaoping, who had under Mao been sidelined more than once, pushed to one side. But the significant thing is Mao was never able to eliminate Deng completely. And that, that, that is explained, I think, by the fact that within the, the bureaucracy, there were large layers who were sim sympathetic to Deng, Xiaoping, and that's why he couldn't be pushed to, uh, uh, couldn't be completely eliminated from, from the scene. After, Ma after Mao's death in, in the period 77-78, a debate began within the Chinese Communist Party over the question of opening up more to foreign investment. In 1979, Deng raised the idea of the four special economic zones around Hong Kong and Macau. Um, remember that Hong Kong and Macau were not part of China, they were capitalist enclaves. Hong Kong under the British and Macau was Portuguese. Um, so it was developing these special zones near to where capitalism existed in, in Guangdong and Fujian. Um, and we would argue that some, some, some groups on the left say that uh, Ma, uh, China turned capitalist as soon as Ma, Mao was dead or when Deng came to power. We would argue that's not the case. We would, we would argue that what the bureaucracy was trying to do was to stimulate economic growth uh, by allowing certain market reforms to be in, introduced into the economy, but at the same time they maintained overall state control and it was still state planning uh, within the economy. But they proceeded to create the four special economic zones with the idea of attracting foreign capital and foreign advanced technology which they understood they required in order to develop the Chinese economy. Now, the land is where they started with the, with, the, with the reforms. The old collective system was broken up. It's actually amazing to see how quickly that happened. In, in agriculture, the breakup of the collectives was, 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 uh, was rather uh, rapid, where they introduced the concept of leasing land for private agricultural production, and the collectives were broken up. So basically, in the 80s, what we saw was capitalist methods introduced into agriculture, um, which affected a huge section of the population. At that time, 80% of the Chinese population lived on the land. So in reality, you know, four-fifths of the Chinese population was exposed to capitalist methods rather early on, although in industry, it was still, there was still a little bit of time to come. In 1983, we had the introduction of measures in the state-owned enterprises which allowed those companies to hire workers on a contract basis. Before, life, the jobs were for life, uh, with a series of guarantees that went with it, housing, uh, schooling, uh, kindergartens, etc. It, it introduced the concept that you could hire workers on a temporary basis, which meant they weren't, they weren't permanently employed. Um, and that was the beginning also of the reform in that sector. And more and more, you read the, the thinking and, the, and then the analysis of the Chinese bureaucracy, the concept that the profit motive had to be introduced as a guiding principle <coughs> in the economy. But in the mid-80s, this, this, this was where China was. And we would argue that it was still at the level of the bureaucracy looking for some kind of market stimuli to make the plan more efficient. Um, not, as some would argue, that it was already capitalist. I mean, th th there's a process taking place here. And as Marxists, we understand that, you know, a process starts doesn't mean that it's reached its objective or has qualitatively changed into something else. You know, water starts boiling as soon as you heat it, but it doesn't create steam until it reaches quite a high temperature. So it's on the way to boiling point. There's no guarantee it will get there. If you, if you turn the gas off, the water will go cold again, back, back to what it was. Um, so it has the potential, but that, that's not, that was not the thinking of the bureaucracy at the time. Um, in 1984, we start to see a change in the terminology that reflects the changes in the economy. At the 12th Party Congress, they start to talk about the planned commodity economy, which is a contradiction in terms, <laughs> because commodities are for sale in the market. The market cannot be planned. The market, you cannot calculate it precisely. We see the effects of that here in America and in, and in Europe. But that was, the, that was the way they were starting to think. 1987, at the 13th Party Congress, they, 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 they started to develop an, the, 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 they, they developed the idea of an export-orientated economy, 
Now, of course, of course export oriented economy means you're exporting beyond the borders of China and therefore working for the market outside of China. Um, and on that basis, we saw an increase in the imports of machinery. They started to import technology from the West. Obviously, they didn't have the, s the same level of technology as the West, and they needed to acquire it from the West. This actually led temporarily, completely opposite to what we have today, um, a sharp rise in China's balance of trade uh, deficit. And at the same time, inflation was being imported into the country. And in the, in the years 88-89, we had 18% increase in prices, something Chinese had never seen for, for a long time. In order to try and slow down the overheating of the economy, the government introduced monetary controls in 1988. Um, and this provoked something which was unprecedented for the Chinese economy, a dip in, the, in production. There was actually a recession in 1989, which is not something which, is, which actually belongs to a planned economy. Um, the crisis of the planned economy is of a completely different nature to that of a market economy. It was this accumulation of events over a, more or less a 10-year period that led to, to the Tian, Tiananmen. It was the pressures on the, on, especially in the urban centers, inflation, um, and uh, um, the, the, the effects of the overall reforms that led to the famous events of Tiananmen. Now, in Tiananmen, very little is um, published by this or the media, but the students were singing the Internationale, a communist song. The workers attempted to build their own union, and they were challenging the privileges and the results of these reforms, which were leading to a greater and greater social inequality. So the movement of 1989, in, re in reality, was a movement against the capitalist effects, or the, the market measures that had been introduced. And you had the potential for what we would define as a political revolution, i.e., the workers were not struggling to give the companies back to the capitalists. They were struggling against those measures. And what they were struggling for was a greater say in the running of the economy. And uh, they went to the, to the degree that the workers actually declared their own independent autonomous uh, workers' uh, union. That uh, is what decided Deng's policy. Once he saw the workers declaring an independent union, which is something that terrified the bureaucracy, the idea that the working class could start to organize independently, that's when he ordered t the tanks to go in. And there was brutal repression, not just on the day in which they crushed Tiananmen, but for weeks afterwards they hunted all the activists who had been involved in this movement, house to house, in all the neighborhoods, and a regime of terror was, was imposed, and it was clear what the message was. You try, you dare organize and challenge the, the regime, we will crush you brutally. And it had an effect, that kind of defeat has an effect over years. It, it paralyzes the working class, it, it can demoralize the working class, and it was actually an element that later on allowed the further acceleration towards capitalism. There were some international events which also were of concern to the Chinese bureaucracy right at that moment, and Tiananmen must have sent them a clear warning, because that was, the, that was the year that Stalinism collapsed in Eastern Europe. Here was this powerful superpower, the Soviet Union, which could challenge the United States for global supremacy, which, had achieved, which could, could, uh, could challenge it in, in, in warfare, nuclear arms, influence around the world, and there was a, kind of, there was a balance in the, in, in the powers on a world level. In one year, in a few months, it started in one country, and like a domino effect, the whole of Eastern Europe collapsed and began the process of transition to capitalism in Eastern Europe. Not long afterwards, an even greater shock for the Chinese bureaucracy was 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And it wasn't just an economic collapse, it was a political collapse because the Soviet Union broke up into its 15 component republics, which then uh, separated um, from the domination of, um, of uh, Moscow. And subsequently, between 91 and 98, the, the economy of Russia collapsed by about 60% in that period, which is the equivalent to what you get in two world wars in terms of destruction. Such was the disaster of the collapse of the old planned economy in, uh, in Russia. Now, it's the Chinese bureaucracy clearly studying world events and studying what happened in the Soviet Union, 
And what they did after 1989, if you look at their economic policies, was to slow down the process of what they call reform, market reforms, in an attempt to try and stabilize the situation. But, but very shortly, within a few years, um, in 1992, that the process began to accelerate again. And at the 14th Party Congress of that year, we have the term socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics. Now, the socialist market economy is, is again a contradiction in, in, in terms. What they did was they, 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 they highlighted 2,500 locally owned state-owned enterprises, in, sorry, sorry, local state-owned enterprises, and about 100 centrally run state-owned enterprises and prepared them for conversion for privatization. By 1998, all of these had been privatized. Now, um, if we look at other figures, I have figures here from a book by Stephen Green and Guy S. Liu, it's called Exit the Dragon, Privatization and State Control in China. They say that a survey carried out in 1993 revealed that the bulk of small and medium-sized state-owned enterprises had been privatized. The small and medium-sized SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, represented 95% of the total SOEs in numerical terms. In terms of actual production, they represented 43.3% of the state sector's output and 38% of fixed assets. Thus, we see how around 40% of industrial output had already been privatized by the mid-90s. Um, mid At the same time, however, in 1994, the state, uh, they, 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 they decided that the state would remain in the control of the thousand top major state-owned enterprises and they would allow the, the rest to be either leased or privatized. Um, now, this shows uh, a dual policy, liberalization, privatization of the small and medium, combined with this of course was a, a big increase in for foreign direct investment which contributed to a huge development of a private sector directly controlled by, um, by uh, foreign capital, which I'll give the figures in a minute. But it, it, at the end of the 1990s, the state-owned enterprises employed 83 million people, which was about 12% of the total employment. Um, it was large, but, um, the, the, you've got to remember there was a large percentage of people working in the rural uh, agricultural sector where already capitalist relations had been established. Um, in the cities, in the urban areas, the state sector employed about 30% of the workforce. But compare that to 1978, where 78% of urban employment was, state, was, was in the state. You see the significant shift within the urban uh, economy away from um, uh, state, uh, state employment to, to private. Um, now, let me go on. By the end of the 1990s, I can't go into all the details here, but the, the state-owned enterprises, the state sector as a percentage of GDP, according to some figure that has, ha, figures, have gone as far down as 38% of overall GDP. Now, in September 1999, they came out, out with the policy called the let go of policy, which, which meant a loosening up in the medium and small state-owned uh, enterprises. As a result of all this, between 1990 and 2000, like anything between different figures that have been provided, between 30 and 40 million state jobs were destroyed. Um, and the, 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 leading to the reference to the, to the famous Rust Belt in the Northeast, where major state owned enterprises that had been closed um, led to the um, elimination of these jobs. And at the same time, a growing capitalist sector within the economy. And this has led to a situation now where, and it's not easy to get exact statistics, it depends on which source you look at, but anything between 50 and 60 percent of GDP is now produced in the private sector. 450 of the top 500 multinationals operate in China. Um, now, there's a lot of debate about how big the private sector is, etc. But the most conservative figure that I've seen, um, which is a Chinese source, says 51% of GDP is privately produced. The OECD says it's 70%. Chinese trade unions, the, the, the so-called 
trade unions, the state trade unions, have made statements, according to them, it's around 60%, as also have Chinese chambers of commerce have, have given this figure. And considering that the most conservative is 51 and the most uh, liberal is 70, we can hazard a guess that roughly 60% of GDP is privately produced. However, there is that 40%, roughly 40%, which is the state sector, those famous 1,000 state-owned enterprises, still have control over key sectors such as oil, energy, telecommunications, the military industry, etc., that the state has held on to key sectors through which the state can still have a control uh, or, gu or guide at least uh, certain economic processes. Now this, we believe, has led to some confusion on the left. Some, some people on the left still see China as if it was a communist uh, state. We would argue that this makeup of the economy denies that, apart from the fact that our analysis was that it wasn't communist before either. It was a Stalinist regime with a bureaucracy. What we could say is, is it still a planned economy? That's a question that can be raised. And we think that with this level of um, private production, planning has been, has, has been removed from the economy. That doesn't mean the state doesn't have a say in the economy. Also, uh, today we have this, the, the dominant ideology of the bourgeois is the state is bad, uh, private is good, and the state should be pushed out of the economy completely. However, they seem to forget their own history. Capitalism has not always been a system that's been based on 100% uh, private ownership of the means of production. In Italy, 1934, after the 1929 crash, and Italy was a weak economy, in order to save capitalism in Italy, Mussolini nationalized the major banks. As a, re as a result, the government ended up owning 70% of the shares in all major companies, and he boasted that he controlled three quarters of the economy. Even into the 1970s, Italy had a state sector which was about 50% of, um, of uh, production. In the same period, countries like Britain, France and Germany had state sectors of between 30 and 35 percent. Today, Iran has a state sector of between 60 and 80 percent. It's in the process of being privatized. In Europe, this sector has gone down dramatically since the 70s through, through privatization. But in the post-war period, if you look at the makeup of the major advanced capitalist countries, they all had major state sectors. And the state was playing a key role in the development of capitalism. After all, what is Keynesianism if it's not the state playing a significant role? But it's capitalism. It's not planned economy. It's not a worker state. India, to this day, still has five-year plans and has had ever since uh, the 40s with a significant state sector, although reduced compared to the past. This was all what you could define as state-led capitalism. The state promoting the development of capitalism where private capital was not uh, sufficiently strong or capable of, of doing so. And it's not the first time in history also that we've seen the state playing a leading role in the development of capitalism. For instance, Germany under Bismarck, um, early capitalist development in Germany was actually strongly promoted by the state. And even if you look at the history of Japan, Japan is a powerful capitalist country and for many decades it was the state that determined the growth of Japanese industry. Very often, um, state companies in joint ventures with United States companies attracting foreign investment and technology. I've just mentioned two of the most powerful capitalist countries in the world, Japan and Germany, and their capitalist development was not the market, private enterprise, the capitalist class, the bourgeoisie, etc. It was the state. Now, State enterprises do not mean socialism. Uh, they can mean it, but they don't mean socialism. They don't necessarily mean planning. It reflects the weakness of the bourgeoisie at a given uh, uh, moment. Now, going back to China, the Chinese bureaucracy, the Chinese leaders, they are not going to hand over the top state-owned enterprises to private uh, capital. Because in the present context, there isn't a Chinese bourgeoisie that is capable of buying up these companies. And the Chinese bureaucracy is not going to allow the imperialists, Western imperialism, to come in and dominate their economy. Because if they did open up completely and sold off all those thousand enterprises, it would be the United States, Europe, Japan, and others who would buy up um, these companies. So they'll hold on um, to these companies 
but they're using them to build Chinese capitalism through the state. Um, so what we have is a combination of state, a state sector, which is roughly 40%, we have the foreign direct investment, the foreign-owned uh, private sector, which is close to 30%. So there's a significant foreign capitalism in, in, China, in China. And then there are the indigenous uh, private enterprise, which is a little over 20%, according um, to um, some figures. Um, the, in fact, and, and even even the, the uh, however, to say the, the foreign investment, if you look at it more closely, a lot of it is actually Chinese capitalists from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, and spread all across the Southeast Asia. The bulk of it, and it's amazing. I've read I've read appeals by communist Chinese leaders <laughs> appealing to these Chinese, the Chinese diaspora, the, 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 the capitalists, think about it, are the guys who fled China in 1949 because they were fearing expropriation, have been called back to play a patriotic role in developing um, industry um, in China. And there's a logic in that, obviously, because they have the technique, technology and the capital. Now, what, what we're seeing here is the bureaucracy guiding the process of capitalist uh, restoration. I think it's worth here reading something from a famous book called The Revolution Betrayed, written by Trotsky, which was an analysis of the Soviet Union. But I will read a couple of quotes which I think are significant. And he's talking about the possibility of capitalist restoration in the Soviet Union. Remember that when he wrote this, Trotsky was, was treated as a renegade, as a traitor. How dare you even mention the possibility of capitalist restoration in the Soviet Union? Well, history sometimes takes a long time to work its way through, but who was right, Stalin or Trotsky? I think Trotsky got it right a long time before it happened in 1936. This is what he said. He's talking about the different possibilities. He says, let us assume to take a third variant, that neither a revolutionary nor a counter-revolutionary party seizes power. The bureaucracy continues at the head of the state. Even under these conditions, social relations will not gel. We cannot count upon the bureaucracy's peacefully and voluntarily renouncing itself on behalf of socialist equality. If at the present time, notwithstanding the two obvious inconveniences of such an operation, it has considered it possible to introduce ranks and decorations, this was in the army, it must inevitably, in future stages, seek supports for itself in property relations. One may argue that the big bureaucrat cares little what are the prevailing forms of property, provided only they guarantee him the necessary income. This argument ignores not only the instability of the bureaucrat's own rights, but also the question of his descendants. The new cult of the family, again a phenomenon of the 30s under Stalin, has not fallen out of the clouds. Privileges have only half their worth if they cannot be transmitted to one's children. But the right of testament is inseparable from the right of property. It is not enough to be the director of a trust. It is necessary to be a stockholder. The victory of the bureaucracy in this decisive sphere would mean its conversion into a new possessing class. And then he went on. To define the Soviet regime as transitional or intermediate means to abandon such finished social categories as capitalism, and therewith state capitalism, and also socialism. But besides being completely inadequate in itself, such a definition is capable of producing the mistaken idea that from the present Soviet regime only a transition to socialism is possible. In reality, a backslide to capitalism is wholly possible. And, and then he goes on and on and on. I, mean, I, won't, I won't repeat it all. We've actually got a document which quotes all this. Now, I think that quite uh, describes very well what we have seen um, in in China. Um, I don't have much time here to, to, to give all the quotes, but um, uh, more figures. A, a survey 2002 points out that 86% of industrial state-owned enterprises had undergone restructuring and 70% had been either completely or partially privatized. 
and, and, and I mean, I, I haven't got time here to give all the figures, but um, a, a lot of interesting quotes about the, the relationships in the workplace, um, uh, the, the, the foreign capital, the, 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 the home capital, etc. But something that's interesting is the, the appearance within China of the phenomenon of overproduction. In 2004, we published an article which was called China capitalism means war against the working class, which points out that China is confronted by a classical capitalist crisis of overproduction. The workers cannot afford to buy the goods they produce. There are too many houses, too many computers, too many clothes, at the same time as the workers receive wages, which are only just sufficient to keep body and soul together. And it points out, uh, for instance, there are 53 companies, each with an annual steel production capacity of 1 million tons or more, and hundreds of smaller or even illegal steel makers in China, and it points out they've gone well over the capacity for the market to absorb um, all, all of this. Um, again, I've got, to, I've got to start quite quite soon. I will skip a lot of the stuff which I was going to quote. Um, now, China has the second highest number of US dollar billionaires in the world. It has become one of the most unequal societies in, uh, on the planet. Um, according to some figures here, less than 1% of households in China hold more than 70% of the national's personal wealth. And other figures show um, the, the growing inequality. And it's, and it's also seen in the question of, for instance, growing levels of illiteracy. One of the great achievements of the Chinese Revolution in 1949 was to pr almost eradicate Ill uh, illiteracy. In, um, uh, here we have some statistics. Published in the China Daily, can't be accused of being a foreign source, it's a Chinese newspaper, the official language, uh, English language newspaper, reported that the number of illiterate adult Chinese increased by 30 million between 2000 and 2005. This implies that in 2005 there were 115.7 million illiterate adults, uh, adult Chinese. Uh, the illiteracy rate of the adult population increased from 6.72% in 2000 to 11.04% in 2005. Similar figures for healthcare, housing, etc. Growing poverty and gradual dis destruction of the old welfare based on the old planned economy and the levels of inequality are actually worse than in the United States in terms of disparity between the, the, the higher levels and the lower levels. Um, and then this, this is producing the situation we're facing now. The latest news about the Honda strike that's taking place in, uh, in China. A walkout on May the 17th at the Honda transmission factory in Foshan in the southeast shut down all four of Honda's factories on the mainland. Um, and the Japanese are having some concern because the Chinese workers are starting to, to organize and fight back against the conditions, demanding better wages and conditions. And uh, China now has actually overtaken Japan as the world's biggest producer of cars. Um, a lot of them foreign produced, some of them also Chinese produced. This is provoking growing levels of strikes. Um, all the figures indicate growing levels of protest um, in China in the recent years, um, uh, strikes, um, protests through the courts. Um, I can read one quote here from Qin Quan Li, who wrote a book called Against the Law, Labor Protests in China's Rust Belt and Sun Belt. He says, fueled by simmering anger at the corrupt local government and pressed by economic difficulties after the state-owned enterprises went bankrupt, workers from as many as 20 factories at one point demonstrated in front of the Liang, uh, Liaoyang city government building. And it goes on and on. It gives strike uh, statistics and protests growing year by year. Uh, according to the Chinese Ministry of Public Security, in 1993 there were 8,700 mass incidents, which is what they call them, rising to 11,095, 15,097, 32,099. In 2003 there were 58,000 such incidents, and in 2004 uh, it, they shot up to 74,000, and 2005, 87,000. So what we have is a growing uh, militancy of the Chinese workers in the face of this um, new development. Now, going back to the Chinese economy, China has managed to avoid a deep recession in the recent period. Again, this is something which leads to questioning of, is this really capitalism or not? So the idea is, 
If it's growing, if it's developing the product forces, it can't be capitalism. But capitalism many times has shown its ability to develop productive forces. On a world level, we have a severe crisis of capitalism. But how has China uh, uh, climbed its way out? The first stimulus package, $585 billion, represented 6 to 7% of GDP. Further stimulus packages, the overall uh, measures they're planning to introduce over a couple of years, represents spending by the government equivalent to 16% of, of GB, GDP. The result has been, over these 30 years, increased public spending. The public debt, which in 1979 was zero, uh, 20, 30 years later reached 20%, and it's growing on the basis of this spending. And public spending has actually grown faster than GDP growth, which explains the growth in the public debt. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly finished. Um, um, and. What we have here is a capitalist-style stimulus package to keep the economy going. They're paying subsidies, for instance, to sell cars and, and, and other things. The chi China has been integrated over these years into the world economy. See the relationship between China and the United States, where China has invested a large amount of money in treasury bonds, in state uh, bonds and stocks. And it's like China has lent America the money with which to buy Chinese goods. But that relationship is to the advantage of China, and America clearly is feeling the squeeze because its, its, its trade deficit is increasing. Um, but it's a kind of relationship where the, if the Chinese were ever to pull their money out of America, it would lead to a crash in America, would lead to a collapse of the American market, and therefore would lead to a collapse also to a significant section of the export market for China. Um, so they're locked in to this relationship together. Um, I wanted to go on, I don't have time here, I have figures here which show the role China is playing in the world economy, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, which we would, re we would de define as an imperialist r relationship. They're actually destroying production in many parts of, of Africa, taking over the market, exporting Chinese goods, for, exam for example in the textile industry that is happening. Um, China is also playing a growing role militarily. It's increasing its presence of UN peacekeepers sending troops around the world, um, taking part in this in this uh, so-called so peacekeeping, as, as they like to call it. I can't again. I can't go into all the figures on that, um, and and the, the relationship with with um, the underdeveloped countries. Just to conclude, we believe that all this process shows that China has gone beyond uh, 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 the uh, simply quantitative change. It's reached a qualitative change in the nature of its economy. It's the, 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 dominant, the, the, the majority is private uh, production, although the state plays a key role also in the development of the economy. But with it has gone an enormous um, uh, increase in the working class itself. China still has areas of extreme underdevelopment, but now there has been uh, almost half the population now has been shifted into the cities. This must be the biggest movement of rural population into the cities we've ever seen in history. And there's a constant flow of millions of people into the cities, which actually explains why, in order to, be, to remain stable socially and politically, China requires growth of 7 or 8% a year. If it falls anything below that, it starts to create growing unemployment with the, with, the, with the rural population coming into the cities and not finding employment. But there's, there's also growing instability in terms of polarization between the classes, polarization between the less developed eastern, uh, sorry, western and central areas of China and the eastern uh, coast, which is the most developed. This is causing a conflict within the bureaucracy between those who want to concentrate investment further where already there has been rapid industrialization and strengthen it on the world market. And another section of the bureaucracy which is concerned that because of the growing inequality, this can create instability which can, can threaten the regime itself. And they're, they're pushing for greater investment in central and, and, um, and western parts of China and also greater social spending to try and buffer the effects for the lower layers of the population. But the overall effect has been to create the biggest working class that we've ever seen in history. And Marx referred to capitalism creates its own grave diggers. They are the workers who produce the wealth. The Chinese bureaucracy has created a much bigger working class, the biggest, uh, as I said, we've ever seen. The Chinese workers 
are beginning to move as the figures I gave provide even and here today I was given this about the, the level of suicides in industry in China because of the, the desperate situation that exists the Chinese workers are going to join the rest of the world working class in struggling to change society and having seen in their own history one revolution which radically changed society having seen the transformations and also having seen had a glimpse of at least the potential that socialism could provide i.e. the housing the health care the child care the, the jobs for life uh, uh, situation when they move in the direction of uh, challenging uh, the capitalists that have been created and this new setup they will inevitably move back towards the ideas of socialism which is part of the history of China and we believe they will move towards uh, demanding renationalization and nationalization of sections of the economy they will move however towards a modern a modern version of that which means nationalization and planned economy under workers control and this time as opposed to 1949 the working class is a powerful force in Chinese society which it wasn't in 1949 and therefore we should look with confidence to what's happening in China there's, there's a whole lot of negative aspects to this i.e. the return to capitalism and all the evils of capitalism but also the immense strengthening of the working class which will add to the weight of the world working class in the balance of forces between the classes and, and we believe they will be part of a worldwide movement in the coming decades towards genuine socialism if the workers of China do not succeed in that then the future is, is very very grim because China is emerging as a major power on, on the planet and it's challenging the United States Europe and Japan for domination on the world market and, and politically and militarily and in the long run this situation is pregnant with national conflicts between the major powers which would be disastrous for humanity so the choice between for the Chinese workers and the world working class is to go back to what the Marx early Marxists said it's literally the choice between socialism and barbarism we already have barbarism on the planet you look at the conditions in India in Africa in Latin America and even here in America itself in, in the in this the, the so-called richest country in the world you have you have strong elements of barbarism um, emerging at the margins of society so the choice is, is, is that and our task as Marxists is to explain this explain it patiently to any worker that's willing to listen to any youth that's worker willing to listen and say we're analyzing and this is the explanation but your task is not just to understand but it's to actively participate in transforming this world in defense of marxism is a modest contribution on, uh, as a website that attempts to give this analysis we're connected to our comrades here in, in the United States of the Workers International League and the Socialist Appeal and their website which attempts to apply the ideas of Marxism to US society together we hope to build a movement internationally embedded inside the working class inside the mass organizations the trade unions and the left in general and offer a Marxist alternative and patiently explain to the workers what has to be done and I will leave it there Yes, the suicide level um, is very high, and that is a reflection on the kind of society China has become. Um, because it's, cr it's created a section of, compared to the past, it's created uh, insecurity for millions of Chinese people, and also living in terrible conditions. I mean, you read reports of uh, workers uh, locked in their factories and all kinds of horrendous reports. On the question of the infrastructure, uh, food. I understand has been the land is still belongs to the state but it's been leased privately so what's happening is that the bulk of agricultural production is now uh, orientated to the market and produced on a private basis but the land is still belongs to the state um, the infrastructure the state is, is building a large infrastructure in terms of transportation and communications the telecom belongs to the state etc so the state still can still continues to play a significant role because we would argue there isn't yet a Chinese bourgeoisie, independent capitalist class, which has the capital, the resources to behave, for instance, like the United States, 
bourgeois uh, the capitalist class which is a powerful independent capitalist class or, or like in um, in your um, privatization um, who bought it um, some some of it was in the small small and medium sized was uh, hived off towards the managers themselves you had the phenomenon for instance of uh, in, so, in some periods of um, the managers actually running down the companies in order to make them more more uh, easily sellable in the sense that the state would want to sell them and then eventually they would be directed towards the managers in that that explains why it's still not a not a large large number but a significant number of communist party members are capitalists uh, quite a lot of them would be ex-managers who have become owners and some of them are capitalists who have been allowed into the Communist Party, which is significant, although it's something like three million or something out of a 70 million strong party, so it's still um, a small part. Um, there was the phenomenon of part privatization of the state-owned enterprises and part the development of, of capitalism outside the state sector from foreign investment, where you had a lot of foreign companies coming in and creating it. So it's not as if you look at all the private industries in China today and say these are all ex-state-owned enterprises. As I said, nearly 30% nearly of, of GDP is produced by foreign multinationals who have, to a large degree, invested in new industry. In some cases, they've taken over the old. And you have the development of indigenous capital, but it's at a smaller, smaller level. Although there are some, uh, a few individual, very rich uh, Chinese capitalists who have developed in the midst of this. Primitive accumulation of capital. Well, um, the, the primitive accumulation of capital in the early days of European capitalism created the horrendous conditions, which, for instance, Engels dis describes in the condition of the working class in England in the 1840s, um, where they pushed uh, millions of, of British workers off the land forcing them into the cities, creating what is required for capitalism, which is the, the free laborer, uh, who is free to sell himself to different capitalists. He doesn't belong to one owner like, this, like the serf. In China, we have elements of this, in the sense that the reality, the economic and social reality, has pushed millions of people into the cities, who become the free laborers that are then employed in the factories um, of China in terrible conditions, long hours, very low wages, and often no regard for safety and uh, security. I was reading some, some uh, before I came in, but I haven't got time to look for it, um, in, um, in some areas of China, the conditions that exist. Um, so that, is, that also is there in China, Ex extreme, compared to the cost of labor internationally, Chinese labor is extremely cheap. However, it's also true to say that in recent periods, through strikes and protests, the Chinese workers have gradually been pushing up their wages. And uh, you hear comments by the Financial Times that say that the Chinese workers are gradually pricing themselves out of a job. You've heard that many times. American workers have priced themselves out of jobs, you see. They're too expensive. They say the same thing about South Korea. South Korea used to be similar in the sense that it was a high-tech economy with very cheap labor. The, 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 the working class has this, this awkward habit throughout history that once it's concentrated in large numbers, it tends to start to organizing into trade unions and demanding um, better rights. And so the capitalists are constantly moving around the planet looking for cheap labor. In the process, they do us a favor. They create the working class in one country after another and enormously strengthen the working class in terms of its balance compared to the bourgeoisie. China and World War Three. Well, I think I don't know. I think in the United States they probably raised this a lot as a threat. I don't think the Chinese bureaucracy had any interest in in launching World War Three. The problem we have today, not just China but on a world level, probably if we didn't have nuclear weapons, we may have already had bigger wars than we've seen so far. But the problem is, you know, Machiavelli explained it that you don't go to war to destroy your enemy. You go to war to conquer your enemy, capture his raw materials and his productive capacity and his labor power. Um, the nuclear war would not just, however, would not just destroy the enemy, all his factories, all his land, all his people, it would destroy you too. There is no 
guarantee, there's no absolute guarantee, there's no way they can launch a nuclear war that would not destroy America as well. Although I remember that in the 70s you did have a few crazy US generals <laughs> who used to consider, I remember one US general who actually calculated that in, um, this was in when it was the Soviet Union was the threat, he calculated that in, in the balance of nuclear missiles, if we went to war with the Soviet Union, we'd destroy the whole of the Soviet Union and we'd only lose half of the American population. And he considered that a good option. It was obviously it's a good return. I don't know what the, I don't know what the American people would consider that uh, as being a successful war or not. That actually is holding back the world from uh, from that uh, development. Having said that, lots of small proxy wars are taking place. The Congo is a quite clear example. Five million people have been killed in the Congo, almost the same as the people that were killed in the Holocaust. How much does that make the headlines in the, in, in the press, the media, the TV? Very little, because they're blacks. They're Africans, they're very poor. So w what importance do they have? But you have militias and local armies backed by the American, the, the United States, with respect to the Latin Americans, the, the, um, the British, the French, on different sides. And even the British and the French who are supposed to be allies in the European Union very often are supporting opposite sides in these wars, literally over control of the minerals. We have it in Chad, the Sudan over oil. There's the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, of course. Um, but the potential is there for more small wars which are all about controlling uh, raw materials, sources of energy in particular, and also strategic needs of, um, of imperialism, China inevitably will enter into this at some point. Um, but at the moment, there hasn't been a major military conflict between China and, um, uh, and the US. However, the size of the army um, is sizable. It's, uh, it's about two and a half million armed men, bigger than anything the United States could ever uh, muster. And 7.5 million if you include all the militias and the paramilitary forces they've got. Um, and they also have 40 million in the reserve or so, uh, and guards. So well, it's, it's 1 billion, 300 million people. So, you know, this, is, this country can provide such an army. What's worrying for the Americans is that the Chinese are now developing their own you know, nuclear submarines, their own nuclear power. Um, aircraft carriers because China is, is preparing to control the seas around it for trade purposes and controlling channels of, uh, of trade etc and of course it's, it's, grow, it's, it's, it's growing role uh, beyond its borders. I've got figures here for its, for its role in Africa um, and the terrible conditions that exist in some cases. In one factory that was owned by Chinese uh, the, the, the workers who were protesting were actually shot, five killed, I think it was in Zambia. There's lots of examples like that China uh, tries to cover this by offering uh, investment in infrastructure, building a road, a bridge, uh, or whatever. So in some cases it's palaces for the president, um, as if they were doing some good. But if you look at what's coming out of these countries in terms of value, it's far, far higher than anything they're investing in. This is, this is a classic exploitation of, of these countries. Is socialism and communism the same thing? Well, you see, there's a lot of debate about this. Sometimes we talk about socialism, sometimes we talk about communism. There is one definition which is socialism is the lowest stage of communism, i.e. communism is once you've, you've actually managed to get control of the productive forces on a global level and over a period of time in dedicating increasing the productive capacity you reach such a level where there is enough for everybody to live uh, well and therefore there's no reason for class struggle and conflict between peoples and nations. That's communism. Socialism is sometimes used to define a stage of transition towards that, where you haven't quite reached that stage. And therefore you still require a state. And if we as Marxists understand that the state is, an, is armed bodies of men in defense of, of, of particular class interests, the bourgeois state is, an, is armed bodies of men making sure the miners don't take over the mines and run them for themselves. As in Britain, we saw the role of the state against the British miners in 1984-85. A worker state would be similar maybe to, in a certain sense, to what we saw in Nicaragua immediately after the revolution. It wasn't a bourgeois state, it was the guerrillas armed had come to power and the potential was there for that to become a worker state. Unfortunately, it's a separate discussion. The Sandinistas went down a different road. But to think that the day after you've taken over the multinational corporations, the owners are going to say, oh, well, we lost. History has proved us wrong. Uh, what jobs have you got to offer? 
um, it's a utopia. They will they will inevitably attempt to organise their their power and militarily also, um, and therefore the workers will require some means of controlling these people and uh, putting them down. I, uh, um, not not physically, but my my idea would be I, I would offer them a job down a mine. <laughs> and maybe put them in the, some of these high-rise blocks I saw today where the Somalis live. They could live there and they could live down, work down a mine. I was like, what's wrong with that? You get a wage, you get a house. I mean, I even give them a pension. Some of them who can't work because they've never worked, we, we could give them a pension, the same level of pension that ordinary workers in America get or don't get, as the case may be. Um, but you would require some force to stop, to stop them, a state with laws and legislation which would say you can't take back your, the, the, the property of the multinationals uh, or the big corporations. So that stage wouldn't be communism because it would require some kind of coercion to guarantee that there's the, the period of further accumulation and development of the productive forces towards genuine communism could take place. Otherwise, they'll take it back. Um, so in that sense, you could talk of a difference between the two. But very often, they're, they're into... It depends on... I don't think there's any manual that's ever been written by Marx that says exactly what is one and one the other. But what we have to understand is, clearly, from the early days in which workers finally managed to get a hold of the productive forces, nationalising the commanding heights and running them according to a plan, to the final uh, objective, which is the development of the productive forces to a degree where equality could be guaranteed, is going to take a bit of time. Obviously, the more advanced the technology, the less the time to get there. But just just to, just to add a comment, I remember a very old comrade of ours who died long, long ago in Britain. Uh, he was an old worker going back to the, the mil days of the 30s. He gave a, he gave an, he used to give this example about the role of the state in the question of abundance and superabundance. He said, if uh, under capitalism, you have to have a you, you have queues, say to buy bread. Lines. To keep the queue, huh? Lines. Uh, yeah, <laughs> lines. Sorry, <laughs> they're called queues in English. Um, <laughs> that's foreign language you speak. Um, uh, as George Bernard Shaw said, two, two, the British and the Americans, two peoples divided by a common language. Um, go, going back to what I was saying. You have a line, okay, <laughs> for the bread, and there's not enough bread. There's a, there's a tendency to fight. When there's a shortage, people will fight each other, desperate to survive. So in order to make it civilized, you have to have a policeman with a truncheon who stands by the line and makes sure no fighting takes place, and they all form an orderly line, I have to think of it, and get their loaf of bread. Of course, to make sure that that works, you have to give the policeman his loaf of bread first, <laughs> and make sure that maybe he gets two loaves of bread, right? Or three, as the case may be. Now, that works under capitalism. Let's say we, we finally get to the day when the oven, or the, the bakery, Makes enough, makes so much bread. There's enough for everybody, two to two, two times over. So the first day, people will be accustomed to thinking like the old days. You take the policeman away. You don't need the policeman because there's enough. People don't realise that necessarily. They will go there with wheelbarrows and take ten loaves of bread. I think this is fantastic. And they, but the bread will st go stale. You won't be able to eat it. The next day they go to the bakery, there's still loaves of bread. Eventually they learn that what's the point in taking 10, 10, 20 loaves of bread? You go back every day and you take your loaf, what you need. Because society has reached a level whereby people are accustomed to the idea there's enough for everyone. That, in a nutshell, is communism, i.e. the superabundance that Marx uh, talked of. Until you get to that, then you still have a, have a degree of coercion to keep people, to, to keep the, the overall system uh, functioning. Um, to go back to what I said about Mao, that's how you get to communism. You don't, ch you don't, you can't tell somebody who's starving to death that you have to be a communist. And by being a communist, you'll be able to make more food. No, first you have to actually produce more food and create the material conditions, which will then lead to a change in consciousness. And uh, that's. The, the story of the line and the bread um, explain, <laughs> explains that. And it's the same with, with production. On a world level, think about it. 30% of productive capacity is not mm. being used because capitalism can't sell the goods. 
that, and yet at the same time, how much of the economy is being spent on producing nuclear submarines, nuclear missiles, powerful armies? How much is it costing the United States to keep its armies in Iraq and Afghanistan? They'd have solved the economic condition problems of those two countries ten times over if they'd have spent the money on health care and education in those countries, and then they, they, they would look on America in a different way. Um, yeah. Instead, they, they, they do that because that's the basis of their privilege. They need that military apparatus. But if you free society from the stranglehold of the capitalists, and all that wealth is made immediately available in, to produce something else, instead of tanks, you produce tractors. Instead of, uh, you know, uh, armored cars, you produce ambulances. You can see immediately that conditions would start to change and things would improve. But that requires the expropriation of the capitalists. Otherwise, it cannot happen. But you can see the potential, the enormous potential within society today to solve the basic problems of humanity. But anyway, our ten political tendency in defense of Marxism, the, the international Marxist tendency, which I'm a member of, argue that the, paradoxically, the present capitalist development of China wouldn't have been possible without the previous 30 years of development under the planned economy. Because if you took China as it was in 1949, there was no bourge there wasn't a bourgeoisie that was capable of developing China into a modern capitalist economy. Its relationship was one of submission to imperialism dominated by imperialism. Similarly to India and other countries. So the Chinese revolution abolished feudalism established a modern state and also abolished capitalism, planned production and, and developed the economy to a degree. Significantly it developed a, a very basic infrastructure to begin with but also an edu a very educated working class, skilled workers. Grafted onto that later on they, they then uh, began the transition to capitalism starting from the, that outset. So in a certain sense the previous development created the very basic conditions for the later development. It didn't have to be like that. China didn't have to go capitalist. It could have moved on to genuine socialism with the workers taking control. But that would have required Tiananmen to have become a genuine political revolution where the workers take, um, take power. That didn't happen. The working class wasn't, uh, I don't know, organized enough. Uh, didn't have its own separate organization that, upon which it could uh, base itself. The question of the police and the control in China, um, eventually, like all working classes, the Chinese working class will find its road, uh, will find a way of, of organizing and coordinating. At the moment, you have state, the state trade unions, which are very big. We would argue that they're not genuine trade unions in the sense of unions which you can, you, you, well, you freely join, you elect the leadership, and you can organize strikes. Strikes are illegal. A strange trade union, which is not allowed to strike. Very often in the factories, you find that the branch secretary of the trade union is either the manager, the deputy manager, or the personnel manager. So these are unions which try and bring together the, the management and the workers. That's not a genuine trade union. However, millions of workers are organized there. And uh, even through that, workers could organize. Um, what we're seeing is, is, is growing protests and a mechanism which has developed, which I think the regime has also promoted, uh, a channel to let off steam for the workers, i.e. because the workers don't, even, don't trust the trade unions very often, they go to the labor courts and, and then work their way all the way up to the top, and very often the problems are dealt with in the labor courts rather than through the trade unions. But eventually, like all workers, look at, look at the, the American workers. The Knights of Labor, if you go back to the history of the, America, the US working class, they started off as a very small force of a few thousand. I think was it in the textile industry? I'm, I'm not sure which industry it was. They gradually became a massive force because it was a necessity that produced that. And in, in China that will happen. They will be with difficulty and they will have to break through the, 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 the barriers that the state imposes on them and the police regime. Um, they do not tolerate they, they, will, they, they tend to tolerate individual strikes in a factory, although it's technically illegal. What they don't tolerate is once workers start to coordinate more than one workplace, which they see as the beginnings of a challenge to, to their power. Um, but um, on the question of the police, for instance, our website, In Defense of Marxism, in China, is blocked. 
you, can, you can't get to it. Um, and we, uh, we were getting a lot of correspondence from China up till about three years ago. Um, people writing into us, making comments about the situation. I was able to write to them, ask questions about the situation in China, the economy, what's the nature of the economy. Some interesting comments were coming out, and then suddenly no more. And I didn't know why. And then a few months later, somebody who'd been to China told us, we can't access your website from China. China has an internet police, I think, of something like 20,000 people working just to check the internet. You know all the conflicts they've had with Yahoo and Google and, you know, to stop, stop access to certain uh, information. So they are, that means, that means something significant. Why should the bureaucracy of such a powerful country fear what is a very small outfit in reality. We don't have big money, we don't have big backers, we don't have advertising, we're not a huge thing, and yet they fear the ideas that are on our website should Chinese people read them. And I think it's because they're frightened of people reading an analysis similar to what I just outlined, which explains what has happened, and more significantly explains what the alternative is. However, I believe they can, you can never hold down a people forever. Um, it was your Abraham Lincoln, didn't he? He's the one who said, um, you can fool all of the people some of the time, some of the people all of the time. What you'll never be able to do is fool all of the people all of the time. And he wasn't a communist or a Marxist, but he knew something about uh, social movements and, and, and conflicts um, and um, drew the correct conclusions. The Chinese workers and youth will eventually find their road to Marxist ideas and they will find them initially within China itself, in the traditions of China, in the traditions of uh, the Chinese Communist Party and even the early days of the Chinese Communist Party. The founder of the Chinese Communist Party became a Trotskyist and uh, was a supporter of the ideas of Trotsky. Uh, what's his, um, Chen Dushu. Chen Dushu. Um, and there are even Chen Dushu societies in China because you can't deny the founder of the party. So the channels are there and they will find them. On the Asiatic mode of production, well this is an economic system which existed in China. It existed not just in China, it existed in Egypt, in Mesopotamia and other parts of the world. And it was a different, when, 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 when primitive society, which Marxists say, talk about primitive communism, Communism means working together, producing together, and consuming together socially, with nobody appropriating uh, production. Well, it's, it's ABC that primitive tribes, primitive small clans of human beings, uh, had to cooperate. Hunting animals is a clear example of you have to cooperate if you want to catch it. One, human, one man on his own, with the primitive weapons they had, could not catch the animals, whether they ran after them or whatever. They had to cooperate in a collective way. So the early stages of human development, of, you know, we've been here for about 200,000 years as a species, something like, you know, 95% of that time, we were living in what we would define as primitive communism. It, as human beings developed agriculture and technique and gradually were able to develop a surplus, that was the basis for the division of society into classes, whereby the work of one human being could feed two or three people, which allowed for the creation of an army, a state bureaucracy, a ruling class, etc. One tribe overtaking another and making them slaves and making them work for them. You can't make a human being a slave if the level of his, if, if the level of technique in society is literally at the level of the work of one human being feeds one human being. For me to make him a slave and work for me, he'd have to starve to death to give me the food. He'd die, I'd lose my slave. I'd have to do the work myself. <laughs> so it's materially not possible to develop. But once you have agriculture, the penning in of animals, growing of food and a surplus, I, I capture him and make him work on my farm, he produces food enough for himself to be fed and a surplus for me, my family, and also the soldier who's got to watch over him to make sure that he works for me. That's the Roman Empire um, and other empires. But there was another channel which society took, particularly in areas such as uh, where you have big plains, rivers, flooding, uh, seasons, you had to work out when the flooding would take place. You had a priest caste that developed. And initially, from the primitive communism, i.e. the little village commune, it developed actually in a natural way of giving up a surplus to a higher body, um, which provided the services, I suppose, the, the transport and, and other things. And particularly, 
this priest caste developed, which would ha which had knowledge, basic scientific knowledge. They could they could forecast by observing the stars and everything, the seasons and when they would come, and when the w rivers would flood consequently, and therefore could tell the the, the, the peasants when to to uh, plant their crops. And if you do it at the right time, obviously the flooding provides the, the irrigation and provides an abundance of food. And the Asiatic mode of production developed in, in, in these countries based on that, from a voluntary, a voluntary giving up of the surplus, a bureaucracy developed at the top based on the control of the surplus, and gradually a state with a bureaucracy at the top of it emerged based on this taking of the surplus, where at the bottom you still had the system which looked similar to the primitive communism in the communes. You had this in Russia, in the Mir, etc. But the surplus was taken up, and you had a state bureaucracy developing. And it didn't develop into feudalism. It was, it was quite a static system that, sort of, that lasted for centuries, thousands of years. But it had a limit. It had a limit because at the bottom there was never a development, a significant development of the productive forces, and uh, despotic regimes developed, the Mandarin system and all, that, and all that. And that was the Asiatic mode of production. And it was, if you look at it historically speaking, a dead end as a system. And in some areas of China, if you look at the history of China, in some parts it tended to degenerate or, de or, or develop, depends on your outlook, towards feudalism. Warlords taking over, becoming, uh, lording, uh, having, having a serf-like system. The central state of the Asiatic mode of production was in, was in war with these people, dragging them back into the system. Japan, for example, in 500 AD, looked to China as a more developed system because on the basis of the Asiatic mode of production a surplus was developed and there was a, a minority of the population, you can call it a kind of aristocracy, um, used this, they had control over overall borders, foreign trade, and also a certain development of science took place. You have the Chi Chinese culture at that time was considered one of the highest cultures. The Japanese were more primitive. They didn't have the geographic conditions whereby the Asiatic mode of production would develop. They had a system which was more akin to the, the, to the, prim to the early stages of the European economy and tending to feudalism. But they looked to China, and there was a period in which they sent the sons of the, of the, of the elites in Japan to China to study the system, and they imported the Asiatic mode of production into Japan. But it didn't work because the, the conditions weren't there for it to work, and, it, did, and it, it tended to revert back to feudalism, and Japan emerged as a feudal state. China, when did the Asiatic mode of production break down where it existed? When it came into contact with capitalism. When capitalist uh, advanced countries came in contact, it tended to, one, push these economies to, in, in, in the rural areas towards feudalism, i.e., land property not to the, not belonging to the state but to local lords and um, and also the introduction of capitalist methods that's when it broke down it never reached the level of developing to a higher level feudalism on the on the other hand created within itself in this in this in the, in the villages and towns the basis of capitalist development and with the development of technique and science capitalism developed from within feudalism and of course, that's what led to the French Revolution, the civil, the, the English Revolution, and the coming to power of the bourgeoisie. But that's the Asiatic mode of production. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with the Asiatic mode of production of today. Um, there is no Asiatic mode of production today. China is using capitalist methods. India is capitalist. Um, they're all capitalist, with some of them pockets of feudalism. Some countries are semi-feudal, like Pakistan, semi-feudal, semi-capitalist. The dominant mode of production, however, is capitalism. That's what dominates in, in, in all uh, of these countries. Um, well, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, but I think that the Chinese bureaucracy itself, at least when it comes to economics and things like that, they have an interest in knowing what's really happening to their economy. Um, as opposed to the old Stalinist regimes, which did literally sometimes completely falsify what was going on. In order to develop a modern economy like China, you can't base yourself on those methods. And therefore, when I read a statistic from a, in a Chinese newspaper that says that, you know, the private sector is about 60% or whatever, or statistics about economic development, and, you know, they even have a, a bureau of statistics which are quite efficient, they do give a pretty, pretty clear picture of what's happening. Um, what they will try and hide is protest, social protest, strikes, 
um, struggle. That they will clearly try and, uh, and hide from the world, but even that, in the era of the internet, is pretty difficult to do. Because even though you can clamp down on them accessing certain websites, you can't completely stop the news coming out. And it's in the paper here level of suicides and there the, are the, the statistics on strikes the reports on strikes they get through so you know you've got to be careful what you do but generally speaking I would say that the, the, the sources pretty are pretty trustable in the sense that the statistics are true and the uh, the news about strikes that do get through are also true um, sometimes you have to be careful the other way Western media can sometimes falsify what's happening in China for their own um, for their own reasons I find that how often do I come to the Twin Cities well this is the first time in my life um, and I don't know when I'll come again I hope to be able to come maybe next year I don't know um, the world's a big place uh, I, I work for the Indefense Marxism website and the world as I said is a big place earlier this year I was in Brazil last year I was in Greece two years ago I was in Pakistan two years ago I was in Nigeria and we we have supporters in all these countries and comrade people just like you who are curious to know what's going on I want to know what can be done to change the world and our purpose is to discuss with people how we think the world can be changed and we have to just make do with the John Petersons of this world in the Twin Cities, <laughs> as far as we're concerned. Well, I think there's a, f a pretty good job of defending the ideas of Marxism. Um, but the, the, the real task is you have to educate yourselves here. And, I mean, we provide a website in the modern world. You can read in any part of the world you are the analysis, and you can look for it, and you can look for information. But we all have to educate ourselves in the countries we're in and we have to fight in the countries we're living in. I live in Britain, and the task is to fight for a socialist alternative in Britain. Your task is in America, which is a little bit tougher, I think, from what I've seen of the general <laughs> level of um, understanding in, a, in, a, in, in America. But I also believe this about America, that, um, or no, the United States. The United States is a country of immense contradictions. The richest and most powerful country in the world some of the most advanced research centers in the world and at the same time some of the most backward primitive attitudes um, on certain questions which I won't list here but I think you know what I'm talking about and it is an amazing contradiction here is the country where you have a conflict between creationism and evolution in the schools and what should be taught to me there's it's not it's there's no question I mean it's clear what should be taught scientific thinking should be taught and religion is a separate issue if you want to you know not against uh, people having their religion but it's a private question which each church deals with according to its own beliefs the Catholics think one thing the Muslims think another and the Hindu think another and they all have their rights to put that point of view across what they don't have a right to is to deny a human uh, development and scientific thought. Otherwise, 